Hi, welcome to chapter nine of Theology of the Body. So today I have a special guest, uh, not Mr. St. Cyr, but Father Brad. I actually beat up Mr. St. Cyr um, so I could take his place. Well, here we are. So anyways, uh, yeah, so speaking like of... a little child. <laughs> Speaking of Under discernment the and being called to hands. love others in various ways. <laughs> All right. So, um, so in chapter nine, we had three videos. One was talking about the priesthood with Father Josh. Uh, one was talking about uh, the religious life, specifically uh, religious sisters, um, but just the consecrated life in general. Um, and then the third video from Father Mike Schmitz was about uh, discernment. Like, how do we know what God is calling us to in our lives? So I want to talk about those three videos. Um, and like, I think that it's necessary first to talk about the fact that every single person has a vocation. Um, every single person has the call to love, right? And that's really what we've been talking about all year. Um, but what's cool is that everybody is unique. And so God has created each one of us um, to live out that call to love in a very specific way. Um, so there's a lot of different types of vocations, um, what we would call like a state in life vocation. So like priesthood or religious life or um, marriage. Married life. Um, or a consecrated single life. Um, but then there's also lots of little kind of specific calls within a call, if that makes sense. So like you might be called to, you know, be a teacher or a speaker or, you know, um, yeah, there's just lots of different little things that you could be called to do within your state in life vocation. So, but the main thing is that it's all directed towards love and it's all directed towards that union with God in heaven. Um, and then through that union with everybody else who's in union with God. Mm -hmm. So, so the first video was about the priest, about the priesthood. what did you think about it? Well, I mean, I, I know Father Josh, we're like really good friends. So it was just funny because, um, I don't know. I, I, I just, I could see him, uh, saying some of that stuff and, and just, he, he, we, I mean, he got his call to the priesthood at the same conference as me. We were at Steubenville conference and, and it was a summer. So I saw the behind the scenes of that happening. It was really kind of cool to see it on video, but um, yeah, I think what father Josh wanted to express was that demystify the vocation, right? Like, and, and same thing actually for sister Miriam as well. Like, mm -hmm. Hey, uh, you might have this idea of like priests or religious as like their statues. Um, you know, they're really old people far, far long away. He, he said something interesting about it, Like he never thought a black guy could be a priest because he'd never yeah. seen a black priest or I guess he didn't know any. Um, and we kind of like this... think what we see is like it, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the people that we come in contact with, and this goes for everything, not just like vocations, but a lot of times we, we think like, oh, my experience is the universal experience, but that's not really necessarily the case. Right. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Sorry, well, and like people, when I see people and they're like, you're a young priest, I've never seen a young priest. And I'm like, well, if we we're all old, then we'd <laughs> die and there'd be no more priests. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. it's not like we, yeah. We like all of a sudden spontaneously appear in our fifties. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so with it comes all of the, so we, so priests come from families, they come from culture, they come from high school, they come from dances, they come from playing sports. They right, they're people that are called to a vocation, just like people who are married, like have a past, have a, whether bad or good. Um, yeah. And ultimately all, all good because God uses even the bad stuff for our good. Right. Um, and so you can be a little more relatable or be, be, have solace and be excited that, hey, my priests, my sisters, my religious sisters, um, my bishops even, they, they're people. Yeah. And if you are like, I'm not called to that because I'm not as holy as Father Josh, well, one, he's not even that holy. <laughs> I'm just, called out. I'm, just, I'm just messing. <laughs> but, uh, but it's, guess what? Uh, God's call, he called regular people to yeah. extraordinary things, whether that's in marriage or priesthood or religious. So. 
Right. Yeah, I think that's really important. One of the things that Father Josh said that really struck me is whenever he went to that conference, and maybe it was the same conference you were at, he was talking about the three sisters who were speaking, but he was saying that like one of the speaker or one of the sisters was like, it's really hard. It's really tough. And she was kind of like emphasizing all of the, are you yawning while I'm talking? Come on. <laughs> I guess that's not much different than y'all in class, huh? Um, <laughs> but anyways, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, that's what y'all look like usually in class. Uh, so Anyways, three sisters. So one of the sisters was kind of emphasizing the struggle of the vocation. The other sister was kind of talking like it was the greatest thing in the world, like so wonderful and easy and fantastic because she, like once she had heard the call from God, it was like everything was sunshine and rainbows, right? Um, and then the last sister was talking about kind of like the balance of both, the fact that like, yeah, there's really hard times and there's suffering that comes with the vocation, but also there's like incredible joys and like wonderful experiences and you experience kind of that, that deeper love, um, that you were created for. Right. Um, and sometimes love is messy, you know, and I think that's important to emphasize that like every single vocation, and we mentioned this, uh, last week when we talked about marriage, but every single vocation has its high points and its low points. It has its struggles. It has its joys. Um, and I think that it would be wrong to kind of pit the vocations against each other. Like this one is harder. Or this one is easier. Like the Lord's going to call you to something that's going to require the cross and offer the resurrection. So. it's pretty good. Yeah. Great. Cool. Um, so one thing that Father Josh mentioned was that our vocation is not about us. Do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, it's about you. That was the, <laughs> the title of the, the thing he was doing. Um, yeah, so, so there's a book by Fulton Sheen called The Priest Is Not His Own. And basically, it was written before this, I believe, but uh, basically it's summed up in the part of Gaudium et Spes that John Paul II probably wrote because this is his philosophy, this is his theology, um, but a man truly finds himself in a sincere gift of himself. So if you want to know who you are, then you have to give yourself away. And so you only know who you are in relationship to other people who you are sacrificing for. Mm -hmm. So think of this in uh, like a father. So on the, the layman side, like a father with his family, his wife, he really knows, he only knows who he is and he only finds himself whenever he's in relationship with the people he has vowed to mm -hmm. love. Um, so a priest is similar, a religious sister, right? A priest is only makes sense in relationship to his people. He only makes sense in relationship to his ministry, mm -hmm. whether that's in the parish or a school or um, his ministry, like administrative ministry, like in the chancery somewhere, like in the head, head of the church or the Pope, right? He's not in a parish per se, but he's, the whole world is his parish. Yeah, so the and Pope only makes sense in relationship to the people. Yeah. So then that's kind of what I was saying too, about like the, the vocations within a vocation that like God's going to call you to a very specific way of giving yourself, even within a bigger vocation, like marriage or priesthood or religious life, or even consecrated single life, right? There's so many different ways that we serve. There's so many different ways that we give ourselves away, you know, and it doesn't have to be, um, you know, the kind of big gift of self of like saying the vow, right? Like that's, that's kind of the fire behind it, but like all the little things, uh, every single day, right. That God calls us to, um, is a part of that vocation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's priesthood and religious life. I mean, Father Josh mentioned it's a, it's a radical call. Um, it's something that's supernatural. So he mentioned that it's not, uh, it's not unnatural, but it's supernatural. It's like above, right? Um, the natural order. And the natural order is not bad, right? The natural order would be marriage because that's what we are naturally physically made for, right? But, um, but supernatural. So it's going beyond that to something greater, right? Which is the goal in heaven. And so, um, yeah, yeah. What, would, what would the opposite of natural be like? So it's not supernatural, but the opposite is uh, unnatural. Unnatural, so yeah. Like, so it's not unnatural, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, basically, like, if we don't get married, we're not going to die, right? <laughs> like, it's not, we're not going to be, we're actually, we, our culture tends to think that way, though, right? That, like, I have to have a significant other, otherwise, I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be fulfilled, right? Um, and or so, on the other end, the other end, they also think if you actually give yourself, if you actually vow, you're going to die, right? The whole idea yeah. of like going to get married is like going to a funeral. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so People joke like about that. Ends. Yeah. You can't even, you can't even get it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Um, so speak a little bit, if you don't mind about just like your experience of spiritual fatherhood, like being a priest, like, so in the videos, they were talking about how every man, um, body has a, has a paternal meaning, right? Like a, a spiritual fatherhood. Um, and every woman, um, has that spiritual motherhood, right? So whether or not we have actual earthly biological children, um, we have that call, all of us, um, guys mm -hmm. and girls, um, to be sort of like fathers or mothers to others. So like, how do you, uh, how do you experience that in your priesthood? So the other day I was thinking that <clears throat> a lot of the parishioners, a good chunk of them are, are expats from, from Chalmette, which is outside of New Orleans in this area. And they talk yet. They like have this <laughs> accent and they say father, like very particularly. <laughs> and I love it because they're like, Hey father. And I love it because it's almost like this, there's a familialness to it. And, and there was this group of people who called me to the nursing home during this COVID situation. I'll tell the story. Um, and they were from New Orleans area and they had that fada thing going with their accent, but they called me and they didn't know me. They were actually in another parish. Um, but I'm the only one who could go because the other priest needed some help. He had underlying um, issues where he couldn't be exposed to COVID. So, so I went to the nursing home and the nursing home director said, no, you can't come in. And I was like, okay, I completely understand your policies, but I mean, this person's dying. They need the last sacraments, you know, anointing the sick at least. And, um, and he was like, well, it's our policy that only family members can go in. And I was like, can you make an exception? I'll climb in through the window from the outside. So no one else, you know, I, and this, he's like, no, you have to be part of the family. And one of the family members was like, he's as much part of our family as any of us. He's our father. <laughs> and I was like, wow. And I, that like actually struck me. It was pretty emotional. I was like, wow, I, I am. And they see me like that, you know, and yeah. I don't know them. I've never met them. And I didn't see them again, but I was just a priest that showed up and the priest showed up and he was, he's part of the family and he's going to give anointings. So they all gathered around. He eventually let me in. Um, I had to do a couple of ninja moves, um, <laughs> like chopped him in the neck, but, but you know, he didn't die. It didn't hurt him. It's just one of those oh like gosh. pressure point situations where they kind of passed out a little bit, but I eventually got back to the, to his room, to her room and, uh, and did the anointing. I was just joking about the oh violence gosh. part. <laughs> so much. Oh man. All right. So, um, I love that. that you, yeah, you experience this connectedness. Um, we tend to think, especially in, you know, uh, America today, we tend to think in terms of like nuclear family, right? Like that my family members are like my mom, my dad, and my siblings, or like when I get married, me and my spouse and our kids and like, that's it. Right. Like in that, like, that's our family. And, um, we, we tend to exclude the larger family, even just like extended family, but also like the fact that we have these close communities and these close friends and these people that we serve that we're connected with, and they can be a part of our families as well. And I think the priesthood is like this very specific, cool call to fatherhood, um, that you do get to be intimate with people that maybe you've never even met before, but like the way that you interact with them is so, um, meaningful, um, that that can, I'm sure bring joy to your life. Um, you know, maybe even well, you know, when Jesus ways. was there and, and Mary and Jesus' cousins, it says brothers, but it, it can mean cousins too. He walked up, they walked up and his disciples are like, Hey, your, your mom is outside. And he goes, who is my mother and my brothers and my sisters? He who follows the will of my heavenly father is, it's not that he's dissing Mary, right? He yeah, loves yeah. Mary. He, he, you know, she's queen of heaven and earth. He crowned her. <laughs> um, but he's saying like the Christian church there's a wider understanding of family. Like mm -hmm. it's not just your blood found in your veins. It's the blood and the chalice, right? You want to be in communion, then have communion with the, the one cup, the one chalice, the blood yeah. of Christ. And then you're even sometimes even more connected to those people that you share that with. And I think converts have this experience. Mm -hmm. You might convert and it's everything about who they are and and they receive in the Eucharist and they feel a pain of not having their fi biological family be in as much communion as sometimes they are with others. So, mm -hmm. yeah, totally. Um, yeah. And I think that 
in the video, Father Josh was talking about like kind of the three ways to persevere in our vocations, especially like when times are tough. And like the first one that he talked about is prayer, which I want to come back to. Um, but the second one is what we've been talking about and that's community, right? Like the fact that we need people in our lives, not just the people that we're serving, but the people that can also minister to us. Right. So like, you want to talk a little bit about your experience as a priest, like, okay, so you vowed celibacy, so you're not married. Um, but like, what is your like community like, like the community that supports you, like what, what family are you a part of, if that makes sense, like that you get support from, like as a human being who needs communion, right? Mm -hmm. So there's different levels. There's my own biological family, obviously. And then there's parish family. So that's like the one that I'm assigned to. So mm -hmm. I've been assigned to St. George and then a couple of parishes out in Vashery on the river. And then now I'm at, uh, in a different part of Louisiana, um, by Hammond and Albany. And so I have like the school I work at St. Thomas um, and then my parishioners here. And then there's like friends, which kind of just go with me everywhere. Um, <laughs> and that's like Miss Krause. And that is like, uh, you know, her roommates and people who I care about there and like other people, like I, I marry couples and I, I, I witness their marriage and I help prep them. And I'm really, really close to especially just some of those couples I got really close. You know, my friends Danny and Evelyn, who I didn't know before I started doing marriage prep for them. And now they're, they're literally like part of my family. Like they go and hang out with my parents uh, <laughs> sometimes more than me. Um, and that's really cool. And I only yeah. experienced that, uh, that relationship or got into that relationship through my priesthood, right? right through yeah. being a priest and prepping them for marriage. And um, so and then brother priests, right? So, mm -hmm. so I was ordained with, you know, one year after Father Josh on the video, and I was ordained the same year as Father Matthew Graham and Father Reuben Dykes. Um, there's priests who've been ordained for many, many years, and we have something in common, right? Friends are those people that we stand next to looking at something. So mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis says, almost said Saint C.S. Lewis. <laughs> um, C.S. Lewis says that uh, friendship is defined not as two people looking at each other, Mm. See, that's eros that's erotic love it's like husband and wife or part of it but friends are people standing next to each other looking at something else mm. so whether that's your football team whether that's a particular music or band you like and you're like going to see uh or go watch movies or something uh with somebody and that's what you have in common or it's the faith right a little more substantial and deep um that's and and we hold as priests we hold something in common with all other priests so it's kind of a built-in friendship Gotcha. Yeah. One of the things that we were kind of discussing and kind of wrestling with was the idea that like every human being is called to community. We have this sort of natural vocation of marriage, right? Um, but we are called possibly to something different than that. Um, or maybe just, you know, through whatever the fall, like different um, experiences we have that are uh, experiences of suffering, right? When we are, you know, like single or whatever, like how is it possible to experience kind of like the depths of human love? Um, like when we're not married, if that makes sense, when we're not like physically married. And so I think that it's important to see, you know, real life people like you and me, right, who are um, in this current state, at least for me, it's a current state, it could change later, but for you, it's not, um, like that there are, it's, it's possible to experience that agape, which is that like height of love, right, like the love that, that God has for us, like outside of that sacrament um, of marriage, that like there's other ways that God can like fulfill our hearts and that there is such thing as well, like real deep and abiding friendship. Cause I think that's some things that like in high school, maybe, um, maybe we can experience like true, amazing, beautiful friendship in high school. But I think a lot of times, sometimes it can be like shallow, you know, um, some people were talking about that and it's kind of hard to imagine that God could, could like fill our heart. Does that make yeah. sense? Well, I, I want to, I want to tell your, your listeners here, your kids. Um, so right now pull out your cell phones um, I want you to go on however you communicate with your boyfriend or girlfriend. So Snapchat, DMs, whatever, just straight up on the feed. Um, and I want you to break up with them <laughs> right now. Um, just drop them like a sack of potatoes. Just oh get rid God. of them. Um, don't call them names or anything. Just break up. I'm, I'm joking. 
Well, probably you need to, but <laughs> maybe not. But the the reality is statistically, you're probably not going to marry this person. And, you know, dating that could be cool, but sometimes we just, uh, we, we lose, we lose the ability of like helping ourselves form and virtue by like mm. making relationships too serious. Mm. Um, when at the end of the day, um, the, the one serious, the most important relationship is our relationship with the Lord, right? With mm. God. Think about it like Ephesians 5, Paul goes in this beautiful rant about husbands and wives, right? Marriage, husbands, wives, love your wife, Christ love the church, yada, yada, yada. All these verses. And at the end he goes, and this is in reference to Christ and the church. So it's only even a symbol anyway. So that's how yeah. like someone who isn't married, right? Who isn't, isn't physically married biologically to this person here on earth um, isn't missing out because the marriage here on earth is just a symbol. It's not the end. Mm -hmm. This person's not going to complete you. Right. You know, uh, they don't complete you. They, they are pointing you to something else. And that something else we all have access to, mm -hmm. um, which is union with Christ for all eternity, experience now through the sacraments and the grace we receive. So you're not missing out. Yeah. And I think that's something that's really, especially just because of like the culture that we live in, that can be kind of hard to imagine or hard to experience to uh yeah believe i don't know um but i mean i know that as life has gone on for me as i've gotten older and i've started to just kind of like become more who i am you know like as an adult and i uh have grown and i've learned things and i've experienced things and whatever and and just like some of the deep friendships that i have with people i was just over before we recorded this i was just over at uh some of my dear friends house that i literally consider a part of my family like they're their son is my godson and like they consider me a part of their family and like you know like there's there's joy and there's uh consolation that can kind of come through that but ultimately yeah it's not them it's not the spouse you know that I might one day have right but it's God right it's God's love that he's showing forth through these people and when I kind of make another human person an idol right? We talked about in the last video, we talked about the difference between idol and icon, um, that like every person is meant to be an icon and like marriage, right? It's supposed to be an icon, like you said, pointing towards something greater, which is the love mm. of Christ in our hearts, right? And so that is the ultimately, ultimate thing that's going to fulfill us. And we can find that God, God will not limit himself to one particular vocation, right? Like God works in every state in life that we find ourselves in um, and can fill our hearts there. So. I just think that's really important to say. Um, just really quick, I want to speak to those two other things that Father Josh said are things that can help us persevere through hard times in our vocations, no matter what vocation we're in. Um, the first one was prayer. Um, and then the third one was fidelity in the small things. So like being faithful to little things. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, prayer, meaning you have to communicate. So if you... <laughs> If you have a friend and you don't talk to the friend, it's probably not a good relationship. If you have a spouse and you don't talk to the spouse, <laughs> which you might be like, is that, that's never going to happen. I will always talk to my spouse. But uh, hey, guess what? Life happens and people, man, it's hard because you're, you're constantly, communication is hard. And so even in marriage and, and people can worry about like, really important things, right? Their mm -hmm. job. Um, vacations, fun things, or even their kids, right? So like mm -hmm. children and, and, you know, get them to the, the soccer practice and this and that in school. And then all of a sudden, wham, bam, and then they're 18 and you're out and you got a, you got no one in your house and it's just y'all two and you haven't talked in a long time or prayed or went on a date. Um, and so if you stop communicating, there won't be a relationship. The same goes for our relationship with God. Mm. Um, and what was the other thing? This, the Prayer, fidelity and the small things. things. Yeah. So there was this cool guy. Uh, he was a military, I think a general maybe, and he was given a commencement speech for people graduating college. And, you know, the usual thing is, is uh, you know, do great things and change the world and uh, all that. But he just said, make your bed. <laughs> and um, obviously that's a military thing, right? You, you yeah. make your bed. It's got to, you got to bounce a quarter off of it or whatever. <laughs> And um, why? Because you might fail at everything else that day, but if you made your bed, look, I'm not good at it. Sometimes <laughs> I don't, but when I do, I feel like I have a better day because it's a small thing I'm faithful to. And you practice mm -hmm. virtue 
is doing the right thing over and over until it becomes second nature. Vice is doing the wrong thing over and over until it becomes second nature. So if you practice doing the right thing, you will be better. So mm -hmm. like even in small things that don't, don't seem important, like making your bed, hey, doing it over and over all the time, you get practice in doing the right thing. Right. Um, so if you've trained yourself to be able to do that right thing over and over again, then whenever the really hard kind of like significant things happen in your vocation, whatever that is, um, you're able, you're going to be able to say yes, because you're going to be able to be faithful because you've practiced being faithful in general when things are uncomfortable, right? Like I get up in the morning, I'm in a rush. I don't want to make my bed. I don't feel like making my bed. It's uncomfortable to, to like stop myself and make my bed. Right. But if I push through that, and I do the thing, right, then eventually um, it's not as hard. And so then I can go up to those harder things and be able to face them. Yeah. I mean, simply put, them. I want to do a good example because, and let's be real, um, nobody wants to get a divorce, right? No one goes in, at least most people don't go into a marriage saying like, you know what, in about five years, I want to be divorced. I want to lose half of my stuff. Um, I want to put kids through emotional trauma. I want my friends and family to, to be dragged through this thing and, and lawyers to be involved. No one wants that. But the right. question is, do you, just because you don't want it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. You actually have to do things necessary for it not to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and those things are small. Those are little, right? So you do that now. You choose that now with how you treat each other and how you communicate and how you act in virtue um, and it's, and it's the small things that when it comes down to it. So let's say if you spent your whole marriage, not communicating, not praying, maybe even being unfaithful when it comes to like images you watch, like pornography and stuff like that. And then five years in something bad's happened. You got into a fight and then some not random girls, maybe some, you know, a friend of the, of the family or something, a, a woman says, and you're a guy. So from the guy's perspective, and she comes up and she starts like flirting and then hitting and then mm -hmm. saying, hey, let's meet. Let's have an affair. Let's have sex. Mm -hmm. um, if you've practiced your entire marriage doing the right things over and over, then it's going to be it's like, no, Easy to I've say already no. done yeah. the work. I've already done the work. But if you haven't ever chosen mm -hmm. virtue in your marriage and, and prayer and fidelity and all that thing, if you've watched pornography your whole marriage and you've chosen other people, even if it's virtually this part, you think you're gonna be able to overcome that? Guys, I want you to be honest right now. If you're watching and you're a guy or a girl and mm -hmm. you think you can overcome that, then you might be lying to yourself. You got to do the little things from the beginning. Right. Sorry yeah. for getting intense. <laughs> no, I mean, this, <laughs> this whole series is intense. Let's be real. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that's, that's so true. Like we, we tend to think sometimes that like the vow that we make is like a magic thing that makes us like, oh, now I'm perfect for this vocation and like everything will be easy now. You know, it's like once I'm married or once I, you know, my face hits the marble and I'm ordained a priest, you know, that like all of a sudden the vocation is going to be easy. But no, like virtue is something we talked about before that like grace builds on nature, right? So like our virtue is, is a part of like this sort of natural virtue, but then there's the supernatural grace that also comes in to help us and to meet us there and to keep us in that, right? Mm -hmm. But, um, but yeah, we have to practice, right? Like just like any you know, sport or musical instrument or um, any sort of like intellectual task like that we're trying to do. Like there's, there's always um, kind of the practicing of virtue. So yeah. If, if uh, I'll say over. another practical thing, mm -hmm. if, a, if you tell me, I'll ask a question. And if you tell me, like if a guy for his bachelor party went to a strip club or did debaucherous things like that, basically cheated on his wife for his bachelor party, then he's probably not strong enough to make that marriage work. Mm. And how yeah. many people do that? So in, think about it. You're in high school, guys and girls. But look, decide now. Yeah. Decide now. Think of my face. Look at my face. <laughs> and then one day when you're 28 years old, <laughs> you've been dating someone for four years. You graduated college six years ago. You went to graduate school or whatever. You're working. And now you're, oh, we've been dating six years and it's time to make it last. And then I want you to look at my face. Remember this. I'm going to pop into your dreams, <laughs> your nightmares. Oh, that's a little scary. <laughs> and I'm going to say, hey, choose now, Fidelity. Yeah. Don't go to a strip club for <laughs> your bachelor party. <laughs> it's a little rant. But it's true. You know, it's like it's 
says a lot, you know, and that's just one example, but like, there's a lot of decisions that we make that carry over and affect us more than we think they do. You know, like I think a lot with a lot of things, not just this topic, but a lot of different topics of virtue and vice, you know, we think like, oh, the little things don't matter. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's just a little thing. It won't affect me. Right. But the more Mm -hmm. we make those decisions, it really does. It changes us. Right. And so, uh, so yeah, we have to be, be careful about that. We have to make the right decisions now. All right. There's one thing that, um, let's see, I want to move on to kind of talk a little bit about sister Miriam, um, and her Mm -hmm. video. Wow. When I first saw her story, I was just like blown away. I was like, wow, this is an incredible story. She, I would talk about like a real, uh, story, you know, like a really real background. Like she, she had these, she said shadows and secrets and she was just putting up this facade and being fake. And I think a lot of us can kind of relate to that, even if it wasn't as extreme as her, uh, situation. I think we all can kind of relate to that, like, um, temptation of, of being fake and putting on a show and, you know, people think like, oh, that's a cool person or whatever. We put up our pictures on Instagram and it, it's all the good things, right? But never the bad things. And we're kind of hiding what's going on in our hearts. Um, and she was saying that she turns to things like alcohol and things like sex outside of marriage, like in order to numb the pain that she was experiencing from those things that she had gone through in her life. Um, But then she said, one thing that really struck me is she said that whenever the alcohol would wear off and whenever like the next morning after she had had sex with some random guy, like that it would be doubly as dark, um, that she was only numbing it for a time, but it was really just continually breaking her like more, you know, than it was even in the beginning. And so, um, I think that it's important to, to be able to recognize like, what am I trying to do in my life that is hiding or numbing, um, the real brokenness that I'm experiencing. Um, and that like those things that I'm trying to put in to like, quote unquote, fix it or numb it or whatever, like that they're never going to do that. They're only going to hurt me more. And the thing that will heal me, right. Is actual love, which all of us, and we've talked about this through this whole series that like all of us desire real love. And she said that the first time that she really encountered this, at least in the midst of her struggle was that priest and Mm -hmm. that, you know, she was sitting in his office and she's like, I'm a mess. Like my whole life is falling apart. Um, and she was finally able to like admit it. Right. And say like, this is what's going on. And then, uh, yeah, like he was able to to tell her the truth, but like in a loving way, right? And bring her to Christ, who was the one who was ultimately going to to heal the wounds and fix the things that were going on in her life. Um, and that happens, you know what I mean, for like for all of us, you know, whatever vocation we're called to is we we all have stuff, you know. And so Jesus is really the only one that can heal us, you know. Yeah, so. I think it's the image I got when she was talking and people have used it, but it's it's good. And you might find yourself wherever you're listening from in the situation. But she realized at some point she was eating out of a dumpster, you know, like yeah. it seemed good. It seemed like it was necessary to survive. And yeah. um, from her perspective, it was, but yeah. she didn't know what was being offered. She didn't know there was other places, you know, you, you don't have to eat out of a dumpster. You can eat, you can eat like the best food, like <laughs> farm to table, you know, (laughs) clean, clean, perfectly cooked food. Like, you know, I always cook. (laughs) In another uh, video that we watched earlier in the series, um, Jason Everett was talking about how he walked in the room and saw his son licking a fly swatter. And he was like, oh no. He's like, you want a popsicle? You want a popsicle, right? And he gave him an actual popsicle. And he was like, yeah, yeah. And he dropped the fly swatter to to eat the popsicle because that's what he really wanted, right? And that's what we do sometimes is like we- yeah, we reach towards the thing that we think is going to satisfy when like we've kind of convinced ourselves that this thing is good that we're, we're going after, um, but it doesn't satisfy it by us. And like what we are really satisfied by is the real thing. Right. Yeah, and on and the so, surface, it may even seem better. Right. So yeah, like, that's true. Like we're something like eating out of a dumpster, like something's in us. So there's aspects of the actions that we do. Mm-hmm. that could be good so mm-hmm. this is this is awesome because because like someone might be out out there like saying i don't want to live the church's teaching on chastity because i experience love like mm-hmm. when me and my boyfriend sleep together like mm-hmm. i feel loved and mm-hmm. the reality is you might feel loved mm-hmm. just like someone might get some sort of yeah. uh nourishment from eating out of a dumpster but there's so much there's something there's so, so much, much more. better 
There's right. so much greater, right? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, eating out of a dumpster might heal you for a little bit or nourish you for a little bit, but you might catch something, right? You might, <laughs> it, might, it might hurt yeah. you in the end. And, yeah. um, and you might put yourself in a situation where like there's drug addicts and stuff and you die because someone's also trying to dumpster dive or you eat something that you shouldn't because it's not refrigerated. I mean, this is all an analogy. <laughs> but, but in the moment, right, for the short term, it might seem yeah. like a fix. So I don't want right. I want to recognize that wherever you are, um, that it's like, I'm not saying you don't feel love. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a greater love. Mm -hmm. Right. The one that actually is going to satisfy for the long term, And that's something that, uh, that me and Mr. St. Cyr have been talking about a lot that like, sometimes we feel something good in the moment. Um, and even for a little bit afterwards, but like, ultimately it's not satisfying our hearts. Ultimately there's something more that we're all longing for. Um, and that's that love that is, that is the true, uh, free, total, fruitful, faithful love of God. Right. Um, that yeah. he actually gives us. One thing that Sister Miriam said about that priest who loved her very well um, in that time where she was trying to seek healing, um, she said, he would always tell you the truth, whether you wanted to hear it or not. And sometimes I did not want to hear it, uh, but he told me because he loved me. And I think that that's really important because we tend to push away uh, people who are telling us the truth and we say like, Oh, you're, you're offending me or you're, you are, um, you're treating me badly or whatever. When in reality to tell the truth, um, is to love someone. Right. Um, mm -hmm. and so, so that's what, you know, we're trying to do is to say like, look, like there's something more, right? Like I want to tell you the truth because I love you, because I care about you, because I want what's best for your life. Right. And not just like a counterfeit, not something that's less than, you know, um, it reminds me of, of that song. I can't hear it. You can't hear it? No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this is the. A... I can barely hear it. Wowzers. Couldn't hear that like at all. So <laughs> the, the power of love is a curious thing. Makes a one man weep and another man sing. <laughs> don't need money. Don't need fame. Don't need a credit card to ride this train. Is that the Ben Rector cover? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just save your life. Speaking of a person who has the a really good love. understanding of true relationships. You guys should look up Ben Rector's music if you don't already know it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Good. Yeah. I just, yeah, I think I love um, Sister Miriam's witness. I thought it was really amazing. And I loved how like the second half of her video, she talked about her own community, right? With the sisters that mm, she's a part of in community so that, cool. yeah, that like she experiences this family aspect, like we were talking about earlier um, within that sisterhood, right? Like within that convent that she lives and works out of. Um, that there's these people that she is kind of like put in her life. Like we, it's funny. Cause like we don't choose our families, right? Like the people that were born in the families that we're born into. Um, and there's certain aspects of choice, like when we get married and like, um, things like that. And there's certain aspects of choice too, with like, you know, okay, what kind of priest are you going to be? Like, are you going to enter a religious community? Are you going to be a diocesan priest? Like, am I going to enter as a religious sister, like this community or that community? Um, and there's different things. Um, but ultimately there's these people that God all of a sudden, then once we take that step, we take that vow, um, he's put those people in our lives to love and those people to love us as well. Right. And so we all mm -hmm. need that. We all need that community. And there's just lots of different ways. I think that sometimes we don't think out of the box enough to realize how many different people are supporting us in our lives um, and all the different ways that God shows his love to us. And that it's not just through like a specific significant other or something, but it's like through all these different people that that we're called to be in communion with here mm -hmm. on earth. So um, she said there's lots of different apostolates, meaning there's lots of different ways that they serve as sisters, you know, just like there's lots of different ways you're going to serve your husband or your children, you know, if you get married. Um, but there's all this, uh, yeah, like a, a sense of fulfillment, but, but even then, uh, yeah, ultimately heaven is our home, right? So there's always going to be sort of like a, a something more, like even in a, in a good, beautiful vocation, there's always going to be still this kind of like 
there's, there's still more and that more is heaven, right? Like that's what we're made for. So, um, she said also, over the rainbow, way up high. Anyways, uh, <laughs> goodness. Okay. Well, I want to talk about this last video because I think that this video was fantastic. Um, and in fact, guys, I'm going to send this to your one note. So you're going to be able to see, um, this sort of discernment chart that father Mike, uh, kind of went through, like he didn't have a chart, but I made it into a chart so you can kind of see it. Ooh, that's cool. Um, but it's like this discernment one oh one, and this isn't just discernment for your religious vocation. Like that's kind of what he was talking about or your vocation journal, like your state and life vocation, but this could be anything. This could be like you discerning, like, uh, should I go to this college or that college? Like, should I go to college at all? Or should I go into the workforce? You know, like there's lots of different, uh, decisions. And especially as you guys are in this specific place in life. Like there's going to be a lot of big decisions that you're going to be making over the next several years. Right. And so this is a really handy, uh, chart to be able to decide. So the first thing that he says, this is kind of like the first column of the chart, um, is to first realize, um, two things that are really one thing. Number one, God knows me better than I know myself. God loves me more than I even love myself. And if those two things are true, then that means that I can trust God and his plan for me, right? Because he knows what's going to fulfill the deepest mm -hmm. desires of my heart. He knows he me better it. than I know myself, right? Uh, he loves me more than I love myself. So he wants what's best for me, even when I don't want what's best for me, right? And so that means that I can trust him, right? Like he has my best interests at heart. And so that's the first thing to kind of realize before we even start asking questions like, what do you want from me, God, right? Mm -hmm. So then the second little state is to, uh, is to ask yourself three questions. Um, first question, am I in a state of grace? Right? So that means like, do I have, am you I aware? perpetually in a state of grace. My name's Grace. <laughs> um, am I in oh, a state of right. grace? So, uh, so do I have mortal sin in my soul, right? Like, have I done anything that is like significantly turned me away from the Lord? Um, and if that's the case, if that's kind of like in the back of my mind and my heart, like I need to get rid of that, right? Like I need to go to confession, uh, you know, go to father Brad, let him take your trash out, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and get into, oh, we talked okay. about like the trash man, confession. right? Okay. Confessions like the, like the also, trash. Like, man. I'm not going to use slave labor. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so like get rid of that stuff that's going to weigh heavily on your relationship with God, right? If we're not in a state of grace, then we're not going to be able to hear God communicate to us very clearly. Um, so yeah, yeah. If, I, if I ask somebody like, Hey, you think you're called to be a priest? And they say, no. And I'm like, you going to mass on Sunday? I'll say, and they say, no. And then I'll be like, you don't know if you're called to be a priest. Yeah. He's not going to mass on Sunday. You're breaking that commandment. You're in mortal sin. Yeah. Get out of here, dude. <laughs> so you need to go to confession first, right? So go yeah. to confession get right with God. Right. And then you can ask the next question. Am I doing my daily tasks? And this is interesting. This is kind of going back to the whole, like be faithful in small things. Right. Am I doing the things that are on my calendar for today? Am I doing my homework? Am I cleaning my room? Am I making my bed? Like, am I doing my chores? Am I showing up at practice? Am I giving my all, you know, like those little things, am I doing the, the daily tasks that are on my calendar? If I'm not, then I'm not going to be able to have the virtue enough to be able to kind of see and understand and say yes to the call that God has. What are you doing? I just keep talking. <laughs> Why? Because I'm tweeting this. Anyway, uh, number three, am I praying every day, right? So if we're not praying, then we're not actually communicating with God. So how are we ever going to hear when he tries to speak to us, right? It's not like he's going to, like for most people, it's not going to be like Paul where he like literally kind of struck him with a lightning bolt, right? Like it's, it's not going to be like that for most of us. So like if we're not having a conversation with God on the regular, if we're not used to hearing the way that God speaks to us and the way that God communicates with us, which is not necessarily through words, right? Um, or at least like audible words that we can hear. Um, there's lots of different, beautiful, unique ways that God communicates with each person. And so like if we're not used to that, if we don't know God's voice, then we're not going to be able to, to hear whatever he has for us. Okay. 
All right, so then the third column is uh, another thing to realize, and that is that God speaks in clarity. Um, so if, if it seems that you have no clarity about something, then you need to move to the next set of questions. Okay, so if, if you've done all that, like you're in a state of grace, you've gone to confession, you're doing your daily tasks, you're praying every day, um, then you can say like, okay, I still don't know what God wants of me. Um, then you are sort of in a hallway that has four doors. Okay, so the first door... Um, is it says on it, is it morally good? Is this thing that I want to do morally good? Okay. If the okay. answer is no, if the church has said very clearly, this thing is not okay, then like, that's not going to be God telling you to do it. Right. <laughs> because God isn't yeah. going to go against the church that he established. The church is his body. Right. So he's not going to go against himself. So, um, so if it's morally wrong, then God is not going to be telling you to do it. Right. Um, so that's the first door. So if it is more, if it is morally good though, so say you're just trying to decide like which college you're going to go to, right? Well, like, obviously like for the most part, there's not going to be like an answer that is morally wrong. Okay. So if there's mm -hmm. no kind of like morality or if it's morally good, then like you can walk through that door. Okay. So you go through that door and then you have the next door and the next door is, is this door open? Right. Like, is it possible for me <laughs> to do this thing? Right. So yeah, for just me, set this picture of like, you could go through that door and then you're just walking up boom, yeah, exactly. like just hitting your head on it. Yeah. So like, here's an example. Uh, I, when I was in high school, I really wanted to go to Catholic university of America in Washington, DC, really wanted to go there. I applied, I got in, uh, they gave me some scholarship. It was a lot of scholarship, but it was not full tuition by any means because it's a fairly expensive school. Um, sure. and I went to my parents and I said, I really want to go here. And they said, we don't have the money. We just don't. So that door was closed for me, right? And so God was basically saying through that natural circumstance of my family not having enough money, like, hey, this is not where I have for you to go, right? Um, like, I have a different plan for you. So like, is the door even open, right? And that just might be like natural circumstances. Another uh, example of the door being open or closed is like, say you guys, like you want to ask this girl on a date, right? And so you say like, mm -hmm. I really like this girl. And you say like, Hey, will you go on a date with me? And she says, no, doors closed, right? <laughs> like you can't like but, harass her, right? <laughs> but what if you go up and you couch it like this, you say, Hey, I've discerned that we yep. need to go on a date together. <laughs> and she might say like, well, I've discerned too. That. And that's not what I'm getting. <laughs> but here's the other thing is, creeper. Well, here's the other thing, like, you could also ask yourself the question with certain things, like, and maybe even me uh, trying to decide where to go to college, like, I wanted to study theology, right? And so my family couldn't afford at that time to send me to Catholic school. Well, the door may open later in my life, right? So there may be a, a time when, like, that is possible, right? And what actually ended up happening for me is I went to Alabama, which was a state school, right, for two years, and then the door for me to go and study theology did open at a different university where I could go and set, study theology, and I could afford it, right? And so, like, there is a, a sort of, like, later open door sometimes, right? And so, we just have to be be willing to accept like the current situation um, and then be able to possibly walk through that door later. And then if not, then there's another door that we could walk through later. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the third question is like, say that door is open. The question is, is it wise for me to go through the next door? Right. So is it wise? Um, so does this make sense with the circumstances in my life? Right. So maybe it would be possible for me to do this thing, but it might end up causing a lot of problems in my life, right? So maybe it's not necessarily morally good or bad. Um, it's not closed, like I have the op option to do it, but maybe there's certain other circumstances in my life that it would affect that would have like a possible negative effect. And so like maybe it's too much of a negative effect for me to be able to say yes to this thing, right? So like maybe there's a really awesome, say later in your life, you get uh, a job opportunity, right? And it seems like this really great thing and the door is open, the company wants to hire you. Um, it's morally like a great job, it's fine. Um, but maybe it is going to require your family to make certain sacrifices because it's not going to pay you as much money as another job mm -hmm. um, that your family is not able to make, right? Like that it would be too much of a strain on your family to not be able to have um, 
enough money to, to support them or something like that. Right. And so, so that may not be a wise door, even if it's something that is um, not necessarily like morally evil, if that makes sense. So, um, mm -hmm. so is it wise? This is a good question. And then the last is, is it something that I want? Okay. So like maybe you, you, uh, you answered the question already. This is morally good. It is an open opportunity for me. It is wise, right? Then the next question in that order, right? Then the next question, the fourth question is, do I want this? Right? So you really do have an element of choice a lot of times. So like maybe I got into two really great colleges. I can afford both of them. Like all the doors are open. I've been accepted, right? I've been given scholarship, whatever. Like I'm able to go to both of these. Then the question just becomes, which one do I want to go to? Right. And like, maybe I don't know, like super definitively, but just, I like kind of lean more towards one than the other one go for it. Right. Like we have this, this opportunity. It's not as if God is, is dictating to us, like what type of breakfast cereal we need to eat every morning. Right. Like, <laughs> like he leaves a certain element of creativity, um, and actual choice, right. In our lives. Like if something is morally the answer good, obviously would be lucky it's, charms. It's the it, greatest. I'm not going to argue with that. Uh, if it's morally good, if it's open, if it's wise, like go for it. Right. We have a, we have a certain level of, um, of creativity there. So. And the, and the benefit of this system is that, uh, it is less stress inducing because it weeds out all the stuff that you don't need to be thinking about. So right. there's a lot of stuff you don't even have to discern. It's like, Hey, should I become a, Brazilian jiu-jitsu teacher right Some people now. in my class, you know who you are, like. <laughs> you might, you might, but I'm talking about me. Well, like, okay, is it morally, like, does a church teach against it? No, you, okay. Mm -hmm. Is, is the door open? No, I've never done Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I don't, I can't become a Brazilian jiu-jitsu teacher. So the door is even say it. <laughs> I can't even say it. So like, don't even have to worry about it. Um, yeah. And I mean, a lot of stuff is like, just stopped at the moral aspect, right? right so like, yeah. you don't have to discern whether you should, um, you know. Have sex before marriage. Smoke, or, or yeah, or like, yeah. you know, smoke crack with your friends. <laughs> like, okay, it's morally evil. Yeah. So like, no, you don't have to discern that. Yeah, God's not going to call you to do something that's against his morals. Yeah, so... All right. Well, anyway, I hope that that was helpful for y'all. Um, Father Brad, do you want to just give us a last little, um, like, I don't know, word of advice about the sermon in general, about the priesthood, any sort of insights or like things that you've gleaned or anything you'd like to share with us? I would say don't have a limited understanding or view of what God has ready for your life. Um, and, you know, I kind of joked earlier at the beginning about, hey, break up with your girlfriend, your boyfriend. <laughs> Obviously, don't necessarily do that, but you might need to. Um, because from our perspective, in any time we are at, before you've made any vow, like you, none of y'all are married, none of y'all are priests, none of y'all are religious sisters, none of y'all have made a vow of a consecrated virginity in the world. Okay, so like you haven't made a vow. Mm -hmm. So don't pigeonhole yourself into this thing which is like, my life has to look exactly like this. I'm going to marry this person who I'm dating and I'm a junior or what, what, year, what year Sophomores. <laughs> I'm a sophomore and I'm me and this person are going to get married. Probably not. Right. So like, yeah. don't just live your life to worry about the things that you can control right now, which is like mm -hmm. how you treat each other. Like mm -hmm. whether you pray, whether you're in the state of grace, like do your homework, like love your family, worry about those things, not the future that you can't control. Mm -hmm. um, and your life will be a lot less hectic, I believe. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you won't be placing barriers to future vocations, right? Mm -hmm. Things you do now might change what you can do later. So right. don't go, don't paddle down the river. You can't paddle back <laughs> up. Yeah, exactly. So like maybe if you're dating people right now, like say you are dating people. Okay, fine. Um, how am I actually treating this person in a relationship? Am I acting like I'm married to this person when I'm really not? Am I doing things with this person that are like really only reserved for like this lifelong bond? Like I shouldn't do that. Right. Because then what mm -hmm. happens if I break up? Um, then it's going to be bad for both of us. We're going to have some baggage. We're going to have some wounds that we're going to have to get over. It's going to take a while. Right. Like that could possibly close other doors to other things that God would like to bring me on, but I have to deal with this baggage. So I can't right now, you know, there's just, um, there's a lot of things, but if I'm dating somebody right now, 
and it's a virtuous relationship. It's we're both seeking virtue. We're seeking holiness together. We're, we're seeking God. Um, we're trying to support each other in our current state. Like and we're encouraging each other in our schoolwork and our extracurriculars and our family life and our, with our friends, like we're really seeking what is good, true and beautiful in our relationship. Then later, whether we break up or not, like if we don't break up, then we have a foundation for a beautiful marriage. And if we do break up, then we're still able to have, um, some sort of like, happy past, right. To kind of build off of with a new person, um, or even just a friendship that remains for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so um, all this could be way, boiled down to you, you don't become the crazy ex-girlfriend meme. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, Hey, call me. Ah, I'm all attached. Ah! Yikes. All right. Anything else? Hey, that was a good, uh, that was a good parting, uh, uh, statement, Father Brad. That was great. <laughs> Good gracious. Okay. You'll have a little bit of an insight into our friendship here. All right. Well, thanks for joining us and we will see you next chapter. Last chapter is next chapter. Bye. Beow, 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 beow.